the ergodicity property of a white sand stationary process implies that you can compute the autocorrelation of that process by taking the average in time of a single realization instead of having to take an average over different realizations of the stochastic process. So this can be written as the following limit, which can also be written on a form involving only at most n samples of the signal of interest x of n inside of the limit. And then as you let the block length of the number of samples that you're allowed to observe tend to infinity, this quantity is guaranteed to converge in probability to an estimate or to the actual autocorrelation uh, function Rx of k. And this motivates a very common estimator for the autocorrelation function, which is obtained by removing the limit. So if we only have capital N samples from the signal of interest, we would produce an estimate of the autocorrelation function using this formula. And since the autocorrelation functions have to be conjugate symmetric, we could fill in uh, the values for negative time, negative time shifts by simply taking the conjugate of the autocorrelation estimate we're playing here for positive time shifts. And then for time shifts that are larger than the n samples that we have, we simply set the estimate to zero. One thing to note about this estimate of the autocorrelation function is that it's biased, meaning that the expected value of the estimate is not equal to the thing that we try to compute, the autocorrelation function in this case. So the reason for that is that we divide this running sum by n instead of n minus k, which is the number of terms in the sum. So it's very tempting to try to create an unbiased estimator for the autocorrelation by redefining uh, the expression for the autocorrelation as this running sum over n minus k terms divided by n minus k instead. However, if you do that, you will get the unbiased estimator, but this unbiased estimator could in some cases fail to be a proper autocorrelation function itself, meaning that it would uh, not satisfy all of these properties necessarily, such as the property saying that the autocorrelation function at time lag zero must be larger in magnitude than the autocorrelation at any other time point. So for instance, you could end up with an autocorrelation for some other time lag, which is greater than this, which would cause negative energy in the power spectrum estimate at some particular frequencies. And this is not des uh, desirable. So for this reason, it's better to use the biased estimate defined in the previous slide than such unbiased versions of this estimate. Now that we have obtained an estimate of the autocorrelation function of the process x of n, from the n samples that we had on this process according to the formula shown previously. It's a simple matter to compute an estimate for the power spectral density by simply taking the discrete time Fourier transform of this autocorrelation estimate, which is given here uh, in terms of its definition. But since the autocorrelation function is identically equal to zero for large time lags, so the autocorrelation sequence estimate has a finite support, this reduces to a finite sum that we could evaluate for any particular frequency that we choose. And this estimate of the power spectral density is called the periodogram. Uh, there is another way of computing the periodogram as well, which may be more familiar, and that is knowing it directly from the data itself. So if we define W of R here uh, as a window of length n, which singles out capital N samples from the process, so the samples that we are able to obtain in the measurement process. Then this estimate, being by definition the discrete time Fourier transform of the autocorrelation sequence estimate, can be shown to be equal to 1 over n times the squared magnitude of the Fourier transform or the discrete time Fourier transform of this windowed sequence. And this is by then definition 1 over n times uh, the squared magnitude of this sum of the known samples multiplied by this complex exponential. And if we want to compute this efficiently for a given set of frequencies spaced by 1 over n, what we can do is to use the discrete Fourier transform or the n-point discrete Fourier transform, since that provides a sampled version of the discrete time Fourier transform. So we could do it uh, as follows here. So when you in MATLAB take a sequence x, you compute the FFT, take the absolute value squared of that, then what you're doing in effect is computing the periodogram estimate 
And what's typically missed if you just take the absolute value of x is this division by 1 over n, which is required to get the proper scaling of the power estimate. But other than that, it's just the periodogram estimate that's obtained by taking the squared magnitude of the FFT in MATLAB. So if we assume that the number of samples of the original sequence x sub n that we have is an integer power of 2, we saw that we could use the FFT algorithm to efficiently evaluate the periodogram at frequencies which are spaced 1 over n apart, or at n frequency points. But suppose that we want to compute it for more frequency points. So suppose that we want to compute the periodogram estimate at twice the number of normalized frequencies, so frequencies spaced 1 over 2n apart. How could we do that using the FFT algorithm in a computationally efficient manner? So would you suggest that we take the FFT of this endpoint sequence x of n to get the original estimate with this spacing of frequencies and then fill in the missing frequencies by averaging adjacent frequency values of this original estimate? Or would you suggest that we create a new sequence x tilde of n by duplicating each value in x of n, thereby creating a sequence which is twice as long of which we can then compute the 2n point FFT in order to get an estimate of the periodogram? Or would you suggest that we compute uh, the 2n point uh, FFT of a sequence x tilde of n obtained by simply spacing the samples x of n further apart and adding zeros in between them. So adding a zero between each sample would create a 2n length sequence of which we could take the FFT. Or would you suggest that we create the signal x tilde of n by taking the original sequence x of n and adding zeros at the end, making it twice as long, and then taking the FFT in order to get the periodogram estimate at twice the number of frequencies? Well, uh, the correct answer is option number four. So we saw previously that by adding zeros to the end of a sequence or a finite length sequence, we could use the FFT to compute the DFT that would correspond to a tighter sampling of the discrete time Fourier transform. And the same apply here where we compute the periodogram estimate since this is ultimately defined using the discrete time Fourier transform. In order to get an understanding of how the periodogram is performing, we could look at an explicit example. So here we see an AR4 process, or the power spectral density of an AR4 process here plotted in black. And you can see that it has two spectral peaks uh, and some characteristic. And this characteristic of the power spectrum is what we want to estimate using the periodogram. So for the purpose of this, we draw a certain number of samples from the stochastic process, generate it according to this true power spectral density, and then we apply the estimator to those samples. So in the case when we have 64 samples from the stochastic process, the periodogram estimate will be shown, uh, will behave like the curve in red here. So this is a particular example of a periodogram estimate of this underlying true power spectral density shown in black. And in some sense, it matches the power spectral density, but not exactly. So it never hits the true power spectral density at any particular region or any particular point. And one thing to realize here is that this is just a particular realization of the estimator. So it depends on the 64 samples that we happen to draw. So if we draw another set of 64 samples, we would get another realization, which may fit the spectrum better, or as in this case, slightly worse. And we can draw a new set of samples and get a new realization. One interesting aspect of the periodogram is to study how it behaves if we have more samples than we had, in the, had before. So if we increase the number of samples from 6 to 4 and redo this example of computing the periodogram estimate, this is what we could get. So if you look at this plot, what we see is that in some sense we get a better estimate, so we match the curve uh, more accurately, but only in some average sense of a frequency. So if you look at any particular point, we could be very far off from the true power spectral density. And this could be a problem if we, for instance, use this power spectral density estimate in order to build a filter, say, based on the spectral characteristics that we obtain from the periodogram. So if the power spectral density estimate is very far off, we could uh, design our filter based on false premises. So this is something that we'll have to address in what follows. So when we discuss the quality of the periodogram estimate, there is a number of quantities that we could look at. So, for instance, we could look at the resolution, which is a measurement of how quickly the estimate is allowed to change uh, as a function of the frequency. And this would tell us how accurately we're able to represent peaks in the periodogram, such as uh, in the power spectrum, as such as this, using the periodogram. 
Another quantity is the variance of the estimate, which tells us how much a single point in the estimate would move up and down as a function of the different realizations. So as we uh, change the realization, any single point on the curve would move up and down, and the variance would be a measure of how much this is, and would be simply the standard variance of a stochastic variable, since the power spectrum estimate at a particular point is just a uh, stochastic variable with a distribution determined by the underlying procedure of creating the estimate. We could also look, if we want to single out the resolution, by looking at an average over several different periodograms. And this would remove the variability due to the variance of the estimate. And then we can see a third property in the periodogram estimate, and that's a property of spectral leakage. So what we've done here is to take the average over 100 different realizations of the periodogram estimate. So that removes pretty much completely all of the variance. But we can still see that for some frequencies, like higher frequencies here between normalized frequencies 0 0.4 and 0 0.5, that the estimate deviates from the true spectrum. And this is a property called spectral leakage. So what it will be is that energy from these peaks will spill over into the frequencies uh, beside them, where we have a lower power given by the true power spectral density. And we'll look at that in more detail later. You can also look at some of these properties mathematically instead of just looking at the graphical representation in the examples. So you could, for instance, look at the bias, would be, which would be the expected value of the power spectral density estimate or the periodogram in this case. And one can show that the expected value of the estimate is equal to the true spectrum convolved with this function here. And this function here is nothing other than a squared magnitude of a sink function. And the reason that we have a sink function here is that uh, we use a rectangular window in order to pick out the data samples from the complete sequence. And that in the derivation ends up being a squared magnitude since we're measuring power that ends up here. So essentially, if you have a power spectral density or a true power spectral density, if you average many periodograms, what you will get is not the true power spectral density, but the convolution between the true spectral density and this function. And this is what causes the spectral leakage in a similar fashion to what we saw in the filter design using windows. And you could also look at the variance, which would, as noted, simply be the variance of the stochastic variable evaluated at a particular frequency. And for certain processes, so like the AR processes, you can show that this variance is closely approximated by the true power spectral density squared, meaning that the standard deviation of the estimate is roughly the same size as the estimate itself, meaning that it's a very noisy estimate. So what we've just seen uh, in this first video is that we can create the periodogram estimate by taking the Fourier transform of the data, taking the absolute value of that squared and properly normalizing. And this is the way to do it. And we could also interpret that as a Fourier transform of an autocorrelation estimate. The periodogram estimate, it has a limited but good resolution. So it has a high potential for varying as a function of the frequency. However, the estimate has a high variance. So for any particular realization of the data, we cannot be so sure that we get the good estimate of the true power spectral density. And it also has this property of spectral leakage. So even if we have a large number of periodograms and look at the average of these, we cannot expect that average to be close to the true power spectral density because we have this spectral leakage caused by the bias or the convolution with the window function uh, or the window functions for your transform as we saw previously. And in the following videos, we'll try to address some of these shortcomings of the periodogram estimate. So both the variance and the spectral leakage by more advanced or alternative power spectrum density estimation methods.